Good evening. Um, what a nice crowd to see on Thanksgiving week. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Uh, welcome to the Institute of Politics. You know, when we scheduled this uh, program, we thought it would be a nice hiatus, you know, in the healthcare debate uh, <laughs> to try and reflect on where we were and where we're going. It's gotten more exciting uh, recently, and because of the, in part because of the, the tax uh, tax reform discussion. Um, so it's even an even more propitious time uh, to get together, and we couldn't have a uh, a better and wiser and more insightful panel than we've uh, assembled tonight. I want to uh, especially thank Secretary Sebelius for not just for being here tonight, but for being a fellow at the Institute of Politics uh, this quarter. And uh, we're really grateful to you for uh, being here. And uh, also to uh, Sarah Cliff for agreeing to, she, she writes with great insight about healthcare and to be here to moderate this discussion, ensured that with these very smart people, we'd have a very smart person to lead the discussion. <laughs> and then we have all these very smart people to ask questions uh, <laughs> after a while. And I just want to say, as always, we will uh, prioritize the first three questions uh, to be asked by students. There'll be a microphone in the center uh, of the floor. And as always, a question ends with a question mark. Uh, <laughs> please put your phones on silent. The, the restrooms are on the first floor, and here to formally introduce our panel uh, is Olivia Shaw. Olivia is a second year student from New York. Where in New York? Um, Hudson. Okay. I'm from New York City. We don't think, we don't think of that as New York. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. So we will say you're a second year from New York, and, uh, you're, and she is studying public policy with a minor in history. During her time at, the, at uh, UChicago, Olivia served as a fellows ambassador at the IOP, including this year uh, when she was team leader for ambassadors uh, Jason Kander and Secretary Sebelius. She's also a member of the Women in Public Service program. Please joining me, join me in welcoming Olivia to the podium. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the current debate on the American healthcare system remains one of the most contentious. With lives on the line, how do doctors, policymakers, politicians, insurers, and academics alike ensure that the appropriate mechanisms and initiatives are in place to get the best care to as many Americans as possible? Um, I'm honored today to be able to introduce this distinguished uh, set of panelists as well as our amazing moderator today um, as we discuss past actions, the current state of, and the many pressing questions surrounding our dynamic healthcare system. Our first panelist is former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Uh, Secretary Sebelius, before serving this position, uh, served as Governor of Kansas from 2003 to 2009 before taking her efforts to Washington to serve in President Obama's cabinet. Uh, from here, Secretary Sebelius was instrumental in implementing the Affordable Care Act, as well as overseeing 90,000 employees in 50 different countries and a budget of $1 trillion. Um, I've had the privilege of serving as her team leader uh, during her stay here in Chicago as an IOP Pritzker Fellow, um, alongside my incredible team of ambassadors, uh, Zubair, Michael, and Sahana. Um, we are so fortunate to have had you here, if only for a short time, um, and we really want to thank you for an incredible and amazing experience in that capacity. We're also fortunate to have here today Brent Ernest, the Secretary of the Department of Human Services for the great state of New Mexico. His office oversees a budget of approximately $7 billion, uh, of federal and, uh, $7 billion to provide federal and state services to more than 800,000 low-income constituents. Uh, Secretary Ernest previously served as the department's deputy secretary in the same department before being appointed to his current position in 2014 by Governor Susana Martinez. Our next panelist is Kath, uh, Catherine Baker, the Emmett Dedman Professor at and Dean of the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, as a scholar of economic implications of healthcare policy, her research focuses on the drive, uh, on factors that drive distribution, generosity, uh, and efficientness of the public and private healthcare uh, insurances of our, of our country here. Um, as exemplified in her work as the, uh, on the White House Council of Economic Advisors from 2005 to 2007, her work is at the forefront of shaking, shaping healthcare policy as we know it today. Our final panelist is David Meltzer, 
the Fannie L, or a Fannie L professor um, in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago, as well as an affiliated faculty member in the Economics Department and in the Harris School of Public Policy. His research dives into the problems facing healthcare economics and public policy, focusing on the theoretical uh, foundations of medical cost effectiveness, as well as best practices for hospital care. And finally, our moderator today is Sarah Cliff, a senior policy correspondent for Vox, who has spent this past seven years writing about healthcare policy, as well as telling the stories of those affected by it. Before writing for Vox, uh, she wrote about healthcare policy for Washington Post, Politico, and News, uh, Newsweek magazine. Please uh, join me in welcoming our guest today as we work for a cure to our American healthcare system. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. It is so exciting to see a room of people just uh, here giving up an evening to talk about health policy. And uh, you know, I think as David was saying when we started, it, it, we really learned this year there are no breaks in the healthcare debate. <laughs> um, just when you think it is gone and dead. Um, we've been debating in the Vox newsroom, is it a zombie, is it a vampire? Wh whatever it is, it is not going away. So I wanted to start off by asking the entire panel the same question to kind of take stock of this year we have been through since we, you know, we had the election of President Donald Trump just about a year ago. Um, what has changed since this time since this time last year? What is different in November 2017 than 2016? And what is still the same? Um, Secretary Sebelius, I'll start with you. Well, a lot is different. <laughs> um, uh, healthcare, I assume we're talking yes, about. Yes, yes. We'll, we'll stick to one. Realm. Um, first of all, great to be with all of you. And, wonderful to have a chance to be with the experts here on the stage. And for those of you who aren't on Sarah's uh, website yet, vox.com, <laughs> I mean, it really is some of the best health news if you're interested in following that that you can get. So I'd highly recommend it. Um, I think in terms of just the healthcare debate, uh, clearly we, we had a brief tenure um, of a secretary who's now gone and again, a vacant department. Uh, which puts things in a little chaos. Uh, we have uh, a series of activities taken by the administration to try and undercut or um, curtail people's knowledge, interest, ability to sign up for health insurance. We've had um, several attempts by the House and the Senate to repeal the law altogether. And a lot of the American public uh, thinks that the law is gone. Um, we know that from surveys and information. So I would say um, a lot has changed in, in a year. And um, it's really unclear. Now we know that a tax bill is a health care bill. And there are multiple efforts in the umbrella of the tax bill really to go after health care once again, to go after specific programs. There may be a $25 billion Medicare cut uh, it looks like there's at least one of the houses that thinks putting the individual mandate repeal as part of tax reform is a really good idea. So I think you're absolutely right. This feels like Groundhog Day, where we're re-litigating and reliving um, a lot of the same issues over and over again. And hard to tell you know, what, where we'll even be by the end of the year, but a lot has changed. Has anything, what stayed the same? Well, the law. <laughs> I mean, the law is in place. It actually is identically in place um, as it was. We now have a state that, um, by the voters' ballot initiative, uh, has voted to expand their Medicaid program in spite of multiple vetoes of the governor of the legislative attempts. Maine is now um, declared the Maine voters are interested in taking advantage of Medicaid expansion. Uh, there are a number, I know my colleagues are going to talk about some of the waiver issues, but there are a number of states uh, moving forward. So, and we have, you know, 72 million people now in Medicaid, the largest program, and we have um, uh, still some of the lowest, the numbers I saw just last month, we still are below 10% of uninsured, we're about 9%, still too many people, but the lowest numbers ever recorded in history. Uh, and I think that's good news. And, um, you know, in some ways, the attacks on the law have made the public more knowledgeable about what's in the law, and the pushback from the public about taking away health benefits 
cutting Medicaid programs, harming Medicare, seem to be pretty strong. So there has been a, a public reaction that has been positive in terms of universal health care. Okay. What about from your vantage point, Secretary Ernest? What's different and what's the same? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start with uh, what's the same in that we're still talking about <laughs> replace and we're still talking about um, how the programs are financed. And I think just from a state's uh, vantage point, it became hard for us to even analyze what the impacts were going to be. The things were moving so quickly and being changed and replaced and a new version was being put out. Uh, so it made it, it's made it difficult for a state like New Mexico, which uh, did expand in, 2004, in 2014, um, has had a robust enrollment in the Medicaid program had a significant drop in the uninsured rate. We were at one time uh, the second highest uninsured rate in the country and, and now about 9.5%. Uh, it's been a, a, an improvement for certainly New Mexicans. So uh, watching that's been the same since it was in uh, November. Um, I think the, the only other thing I'd comment on, I suppose we can get into this mm -hmm. a little bit, is with, the, with regard to the waivers. There's been a lot of promise of state flexibility from the new administration. Um, we'll see how that plays out. I'm not quite sure what it, what it means yet. So I think there's some, some things that may be different, but we're not quite sure yet. Okay. Dean Baker? I, I agree that one of the things that seems most similar is the coverage provisions that we mm -hmm. did get millions of people enrolling in Medicaid who weren't eligible for, and we did get millions of people signing up for exchanges. And so that seems m relatively stable. I'll cheat a little bit <laughs> and say the uncertainty about health insurance exchange prices and enrollment has stayed more similar than you would have liked. I think the expectation was that those markets would stabilize, especially with some tweaks to the rate setting rules and the processes and that that would stabilize the number of insurers offering plans. And that has remained in flux and I think that leads to both higher premiums overall and, and lower take up of insurance that destabilizes those insurance markets. Medicare has seemed relatively stable. Nobody really wants to visibly touch Medicare, but I think there are some quieter changes that could have real import for innovation in the system and the cost of the system overall in dialing back experimentation with different payment systems through Medicare that one of the goals of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare was to bend the cost curve, not just to insure more people, which is probably the more visible one, but also to rationalize the way we pay for healthcare and the way that patients mm -hmm. get healthcare delivered to them. That, I think, has to require a change in the payment structure. And there was some experimentation that was probably a little um, weak in terms of bite or teeth at the beginning, but we're seeing that dissipate a bit, and that leaves us with fewer tools in the arsenal to try to dial back spending. Mm -hmm. All right, Dr. Meltzer. So uh, I maybe add two different perspectives. One is as a provider or clinician, mm -hmm. and there what we've seen at least in Illinois is a contraction of the number of insurance opportunities available to patients and that our institution in particular is engaged with. So the implication of this, it was very clear a year ago that we were moving towards value-based reimbursement and it was going to be relationships with many of these payers that would drive our strategy. And as there's been exits, and I can't exactly tie the exits to the change in administration, but what's clear is there's been no entrance to replace them. Mm -hmm. And so that's one big change. Another big change is um, as a researcher. Um, CMMI was a critical funder of, of, of research in this area. That's um, reorienting itself. Um, ARC is certainly cautious in a way it, it probably wasn't before. And then PCORI is still sort of waiting in limbo. And these are all big drivers. I think the thing that's stayed the same is the problems. Um, the patients who are out there in our communities who, you know, still um, have, have they've gotten some insurance, but many of them still have unmet needs and the challenges that um, underlie them from social determinants and other things. Mm -hmm. So can I ask, I'll ask you a small follow-up question and then keep going, but how does that affect your work as a researcher when kind of the mission of agencies changed? You mentioned CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. Innovation. Yeah. What does that mean for you as someone who studies how healthcare works? Well, you know, it's it's sort of a big ship and it moves slowly, <laughs> right? So you continue to finish off the studies that you have, and um, it mainly affects what you initiate. Um, and the answer is you initiate less of that with the federal government and more of it with foundations that try to sort of keep their 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 mission ahead. 
Um, I think that's the biggest change more than, than anything else, that you, you, you just have to look outside the federal government for the support. And that does have implications. It's harder to do really big studies. It's harder to scale them up. Um, and it creates uncertainty. The other thing that you, know, you do is you adapt to your environment. So the, the, the Trump administration recently put out this, this call for suggestions about ways to reorient CMMI. So we're trying to think, you know, instead of value-based reimbursement mechanisms, how do you incentivize innovation through prices and other ways? And um, it's not always um, obvious one is the better than the other, but you, know, you, you have to adapt. So that's what we're doing. So there's one thing a lot of you mentioned that's been pretty consistent, which is the coverage element of the Affordable Care Act, which I think is the best known part of Obamacare. Um, you mentioned, I think, our uninsured rate is around a little, about 9% right now. Um, one of the great framing devices, it's now more common to have health insurance than wear a seatbelt in the United States, which is a really big change <laughs> over the past few years. I think that coverage legacy is pretty well known, but I was hoping, since you all are very deep in the weeds of healthcare, this law has been around for about seven years now. What, aside from the coverage element, do you see as the biggest legacy of the Affordable Care Act? What's different about our health care system now than seven years ago, You know, setting aside the fact it has a lot more people with insurance? Um, I can start with you again and just go down our line. Well, I do think that the conversation has changed forever in this country. Um, that regardless of what the mechanism is and what the marketplace looks like. I mean, part of the reality is this coverage issue was only ever going to affect a small slice of the population. It was touted as if it was going to um, affect everybody, but it was a small slice of the population. But I think there is now a much more widely accepted notion that the public has, consumers have, voters have, that everybody deserves health care. And I don't think that was the case eight years ago. Um, that just wasn't part of the conversation. I think it's much more the conversation, and the debate will be how we get there. But universal care, universal health access, I think is a much more widely accepted phenomenon. The other thing that I think has changed, and it certainly was never part of a conversation that I had with anybody, is that insurance companies should no longer be allowed to pick and choose who gets coverage based on a health condition. Again, that was never something that, that's always been part of the law that insurance companies could medically underwrite conditions, could pick and choose, could lock people out, could lock people into plans. Um, I think those days are pretty much over. And again, how we get there. The third thing that um, I think kind of hasn't changed but definitely needs to change is how you get to cost. Mm -hmm. And coverage is not cost, and coverage is not health, and we still are a long way from being a healthy country, and we're a long way from dealing with costs. So those two big issues in the room are still very much need to be part of the conversation. Well, let me ask you a follow-up on that. So why, I know the Affordable Care Act, like, um, Dean Baker and Dr. Meltzer mentioning, there are a lot of plans to reduce the volume of health care, but there's nothing that got at the actual Prices, unit price of health care. Well, wasn't there, that? Was, <laughs> there was. There um, was. And I think Dr. Okay. Meltzer referred to this, and, and maybe Kate talked about it too. So the, uh, I agree with Dr. Reinhardt, who just died, that um, it's all about the prices, <laughs> stupid, as he said in 2004. <laughs> it really isn't volume. It's that Americans actually use less health care than many of our neighbors in the developed world. We have less hospital days. We actually have less uh, access sometimes. But we pay dramatically different prices, three, four, five times drugs, MRIs, days in the hospital, operations, C-sections. Our prices are wildly different than any other country on Earth, and until we get to the prices. So part of the goal was to get to the prices, the bundled payments. Um, paying hip and knee replacements are some of the most common surgeries in the United States. Rather than paying for each dedicated piece of that, there was a um, an experiment to look at paying a bundled payment and actually um, a uh, payment based on a cost of hospital plus the 
joint use plus the surgeon plus the anesthesiologist. And if a patient recovered more quickly, got into rehab, did, you know, the surgeon chose a less expensive joint than a more expensive joint, they actually would save money and potentially make money on that. If they didn't, they ate the difference in cost. So it was a way to get at cost. That's part of what's been stopped or rolled back. Dr. Price was an orthopod, and he frankly mm -hmm. made it very clear he felt orthopedic surgeons were not paid enough, not too much. And one of the things that he did in his brief tenure as secretary um, was to stop the bundled mm -hmm. payment um, model from increasing. But in the Affordable Care Act was a real determination to, for the first time, use Medicare, which is the largest purchaser of health in the country, uh, use the financial leverage of Medicare to begin to drive a different kind of outcome and begin to actually lower costs. That no more costs would be in the system, we take costs out of the system. And that was getting underway, and that's what I think the new administration is somewhat determined to grind to a halt. Okay. What about you, Secretary Ernest? What's changed over the past seven years? So I, I um, would agree with this change in payment reform, changing mm -hmm. to, a, to an outcome-based payment methodology is important. And I think one thing we've talked about a lot is, is how to do that. It's, some, it's much more complicated and difficult in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in payment systems that have existed for a long time. Um, but it also is, works along with delivery system reform. So I'll point to a, a little-known portion of the ACA, which, which allowed states to build things called health homes. So uh, and within the Medicaid program, we now fund health homes in two small parts of our state that bring behavioral health care and physical health care together, um, put care coordination uh, around those patients being served in, a, in an area in that population, and then try to drive uh, better outcome-based, or, or outcomes through, through payments that support it. Um, along the same lines, we have 10 rural, rural hospitals who are developing an, an ACO model and, and working to, with Medicare, actually, first, and we're talking about bringing it into the Medicaid program. That does the same thing, really encourages them to uh, watch where their patients are going, being discharged to, ensuring they're going to the highest quality, lowest cost um, specialist or nursing facility, and ultimately, hopefully, hopefully getting at that cost component. Mm -hmm. Maker. Building on these thoughts and uh, something David Meltzer raised earlier, all of these payment reforms I think are crucial to driving higher value healthcare use and there's general acknowledgement that you have to get patients cost sharing right. That if patients incentives are misaligned, you're going to have too much use of some things and too little use of others. But now I think there's broader agreement that the provider price levers also have to be aligned. And you know, providers end up being human beings as well, and they're uh, sensitive to the prices that they're paid for services. And if you pay too much for something, you get too much of it. And if you pay too little, you get too little. So things like bundled payments are efforts to align those incentives. And things like ACOs, accountable care organizations, are efforts to say, we have to enlist providers in guiding patients through the system. Yes, the patient's cost sharing has to be rational and reasonable, and you probably want that to vary based on the value of the service, as well as the patient's income and all sorts of other factors. You want it to be nuanced, but that's not enough. Patients can't be expected to be doctors and to know, do I really need that MRI or not? And you need the provider's incentives to say, for the patients who really need the MRI, we want to get them to the front of the line. For the patients who don't really need the MRI, the provider has some responsibility to try to discourage it, and that should be both um, by aligned with finances mm -hmm. and aligned with expectations in terms of who's going to make it into the preferred network, who's going to be a preferred provider. So a combination of provider payments and the strategic use of narrow networks I think is relatively new and I hope here to stay. Although there, there's a question about how much we're mm -hmm. gonna see, how much experimentation we're gonna see on those provider mm -hmm. payments. I don't wanna cut off Dr. Meltzer, but I just wanna add one thing. I think. Um, the dean is absolutely right, but America is paying four times as much for an MRI mm -hmm. as Switzerland or Germany. So we still have a, even if you would cut the number of MRIs, we are still paying prices 
that bear no relationship to what anybody else in the world is paying. So I, I think it's both, right. and we haven't gotten to the price piece of it very much at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sort of two comments about both the patient side of it and then probably more importantly about the, the sort of payment system side. I, I think that this idea that we're going to dramatically decrease healthcare expenditures by making patients pay more of it is just you know, impossible. Um, you know, the RAND health insurance experiment is often cited as evidence that people are response to price. What people don't appreciate it is the big surprise result of that is they are not very responsive to price. And that's particularly true when you look at where most of the money is spent, which is on people who have very high expenditures, and there's no way we're going to make them sensitive to price. So I think that's not the story. I think the story really is about how we pay providers. And uh, uh, two comments about sort of this shift to value. Um, the first is that it's not nearly as new, perhaps, as we might think it is. It goes back at least 30 years to Medicare prospective payment, and it was tremendously successful then. Um, I will say that I am somewhat more cautious about the experiments we're in right now. Um, the, um, the experience with ACOs is mixed. Some have saved money, many have not, and th those that have have often not saved, saved very much. And so I think there are some really serious questions about whether we have the infrastructure in place to support a system that incentivizes paying for value appropriately, which really requires that um, you have adequate risk adjustment. And one of my fears right now is that it's actually much harder to save money by improving patient care than it is by avoiding the care of very sick patients. And I, you know, I think that's a desperate national need to figure out how to solve that problem. Because I think there's broad political support for this idea of pay for value, mostly, with a few exceptions. I think where it really breaks down is people's concern that it's um, not being done in a way that adequately rewards um, you know, care um, and, and produces good outcomes, depending on how you value each of those. So Dean Baker, I want to ask you, you've been involved in what I think is some of the most interesting innovative research on health insurance that I read as a journalist. Um, you worked on the Oregon Health Experiment, which was this fantastic experiment looking at what changes when people get health insurance. And I think one of the big questions this year is what, what do you get when you get health insurance? Do you actually get healthier? Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you found in your research? What, what do we know about what happens when millions of people gain coverage? Well, thank you very much. And it, it turns out to be a much harder question to answer than you would think if you just compare the health outcomes of people who are on Medicaid to the health outcomes of the uninsured, you get a very misleading picture. People who are on Medicaid have a higher mortality rate than the uninsured. That does not mean Medicaid is killing them. It, <laughs> you get on Medicaid by being poor or by having a disabling health condition. All of those are bad for your health. And so those naive comparisons can be really misleading. We had this chance in Oregon, thanks to some innovative state policy, to really compare people on Medicaid to their counterparts who were uninsured who looked very similar because Oregon had a lottery for a limited number of spots. This is pre-ACA Obamacare. And we used that lottery as a randomized controlled trial to see what is the effect of Medicaid using the same standards of scientific evidence that you would expect of a drug trial or a medical device trial. And what we found was a nuanced story, and the current policy debate doesn't really seem amenable to the nuanced <laughs> story. Uh, people on Medicaid were clearly much better off than if they were uninsured. They reported getting access to better quality care, having all of their health care needs met. Depression rates dropped by nine percentage points, or 30%, which is an enormous drop in depression. People were much more financially stable. I think. We forget that insurance is supposed to be about financial protection as well as access to care. So when you get Medicaid, you're much less likely to get evicted from your apartment because you didn't pay your rent because you had a hospital bill. So people were much better off. But we did not find any appreciable improvements, any statistically significant improvements in lots of chronic physical health conditions like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetic blood sugar control. So you might. Um, think, well, Medicaid's not actually curing those chronic conditions that are the forecasters of all sorts of adverse health events and really expensive to the healthcare system. And I think that it's true that the current typical Medicaid program 
doesn't do an adequate job in bringing down people's blood pressure and getting them to manage their difficult chronic conditions. I don't think many health insurance programs do. We see high blood pressure in people on Medicare and the commercially insured. So there's clearly room for innovation on the health insurance side in driving better management of expensive chronic health conditions. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's no open question about whether people on Medicaid are better off than if they were uninsured. Mm -hmm. It seems to me from the evidence clear that they're better off, but unclear that Medicaid is the optimal program for managing their health. I don't know if anyone else wanted to react to that at all. She's well, right. OK. <laughs> That's great. That's my reaction as well. Um, I was hoping Secretary Civilis and Secretary Ernest, you could talk a little bit. We're right in the middle of open enrollment right now. This is the first open enrollment period that has been overseen by the Trump administration. Shh, it's a secret. <laughs> well, there has um, been a 90% cut to the advertising budget, a 70% cut to the outreach budget. Um, the period is half as long as it was the past few years. I was curious if you could talk about kind of how you think it's going, how much, how much sway does an administration have over how this goes? And maybe you could give us the view from what's happening in New Mexico. Well, I think at the national level, there clearly has been an attempt by the administration to do everything they could first to kind of undermine the law, and then when they couldn't repeal the law to go after the stability of the existing law. And open enrollment, as you say, is underway. It's, it's half as long, so it, it ends on the 15th of December. Um, it very little advertising. And um, while we never had adequate funds to do robust advertising, I would say that we knew outreach mattered. I mean, we could watch every time the president would say something or go on Twitter or give an interview, you could watch the enrollment numbers literally course by. He would remind people that open enrollment was underway and go sign up, and you could watch ticks all over the country that that had an impact on people. What we see right now is in states where governors want the program to work, where there are mayors who are driving enrollment, where there are people who healthcare providers, advocates, whatever, they have much higher numbers mm -hmm. than in states um, often who need the help the most but don't have that kind of uh, enrollment underway. There are some pretty robust numbers. Mm -hmm. The first week of open enrollment had more than the first week um, of a year ago, significantly more. Mm -hmm. I was saying to Sarah, there's some um, indication, though, that you know, since the time is half, do we have to look at the first two weeks of last year to compare to a week of this year? And if so, we're running behind, not ahead. It's a little tricky to figure out what will happen at the end, because what we've always seen is a big surge at the end. We know that this administration had a huge dent in 2017 enrollment, because they pulled all the advertising for the last 10 days of 2017 enrollment that went from until the 31st of January. So when President Trump came into office on the 20, 20th of January, they pulled all the advertising down and, it, and enrollment flattened. It usually has a big surge at the end when people are reminded that it's the end, you better sign up, you know, you're gonna lose your chance. So what will happen at the end this year if they don't tell anybody it's the end is- When the end is at a new date this right, year. Right, it's the 15th of December, much earlier than it's been in the past. So. Um, you know, people who are resilient and need health insurance will find their way in, even if it is a secret. What also we know is that the help on the ground, the community groups who actually were hired because they have cultural competency, because they speak the neighborhood language, because they're known by folks, were enormously important in helping people navigate the system and helping people figure out the health plan. And those contracts have been slashed. So without that help, there are going to be a lot of people who first think the law has been repealed because that keeps being advertised, think the law is dead because the president keeps saying the law is gone, it's blown up, it's not here anymore, and who have no idea that they're eligible for health benefits if they just sign up. What about, what's the view like from New Mexico right now? 
So in New Mexico and our health insurance exchange, we run a, what's called a state-based marketplace on the federal platform. <laughs> it's mouthful. Yeah, it's one of a handful of states that, that we operate our own exchange from an outreach and marketing perspective, but mm -hmm. use the federal platform for the individual marketplace or an exchange, and then run the shop or small business exchange ourselves. Um, so the challenge in answering that question is we don't have a lot of state-specific data yet from this, what you're reading about as higher enrollment. We don't really know yet from a state perspective whether that's having a big impact in uh, New so Mexico. Not feeding you back data. We're not getting a whole lot of uh, data. We haven't for a long time, not mm -hmm. just this administration, but it's been hard to get to that data um, on a as-needed basis. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's our exchange enrollment overall, though, was relatively small compared to our Medicaid enrollment. Mm -hmm. We had projections of uh, going into the ACA in 2014. We had about 430,000 uninsured individuals in New Mexico. Uh, predicted about 200,000 would come into Medicaid and 180 mm -hmm. or so would come into the exchange. We were way off. I mean, we had, <laughs> uh, I think we, we, we blew past our 2020 numbers in the first year and 250,000 people have come into Medicaid and about 50,000 or so on, on our exchange. Wow. And can you talk, you all have a pending waiver request with the Trump administration. I was hoping you could talk a little bit. You mentioned earlier there's been some promise of flexibility. Yeah. What are you expecting from the Trump administration? What would flexibility look like to you as someone who runs a state Medicaid program? Sure. So it's not quite pending yet. It will be okay. pending when we submit our final application. It's out in draft form uh, for public comment. Uh, it is a renewal of a waiver we got under the Obama administration mm -hmm. uh, for the Medicaid program. It's a consolidated 1115 waiver mm -hmm. uh, focusing on a lot of things we've been talking about, payment reform, delivery system reform, um, and um, really bringing the individual into the program uh, with some healthy rewards and other, other benefits to engage Mm -hmm. uh, individuals in their own health care. Um, so I'm just not sure yet what <laughs> flexibility means. It's, there's been a lot of talk about uh, greater flexibility from the administration for states, uh, talk about expediting the waiver process, which can take a year to, to accomplish because it is complicated, mm -hmm. multiple agencies involved. Um, and I, I think so far we've seen kind of a mixed uh, response from the administration mm -hmm. from state applications. Some denials on 1332 waivers, which are another mm -hmm. uh, a waiver for broader than just Medicaid, but also the exchanges. So I, I don't yet know what okay. the flexibility is going we'll to be. We'll check back with you in yeah. a year and yeah. see what the answer is. Um, I want to circle back. We're going to get to audience questions pretty soon, but I want to circle back to Dr. Meltzer. We started off talking a lot about payment reform. And you know, my understanding of the Affordable Care Act is there's a whole lot of experiments going on in there that they uh, some architects have described it as kind of like you know the throwing a pot of spaghetti up at the ceiling and seeing what sticks. I'm curious when you look at the law, what seems like the most promising payment reforms in there? What are the things? It seems quite challenging to drive doctors to value, but what are the things that you feel like you're seeing research that says you know this is going to this is going to work? This is going to help move us to a value-based system? Yeah, that's a, a complicated answer. Um, <laughs> I, I'm unfortunately going to answer that I've seen more things not work clearly <laughs> than I've seen work. <laughs> um, I do believe that there are things that, are, that will work. But mm -hmm. let me just say, if, if you look at you know, innovations in delivery like the patient-centered medical home, mm -hmm. there are places where they seem to have gotten good results, but there's far many where they haven't gotten impressive results. And there are certain intrinsic challenges to that model, partially because the whole idea of a home is that sort of everyone should have one. But yet, as I said earlier, almost all the money is spent by a small fraction of people. So it's extremely difficult to make back any money you put in that. Um, ACOs have been a, a, a mixed bag to this point. I do believe that the incentives implicit in that eventually could support um, improvements in quality and reductions in costs. But uh, again, there's still so much noise in that process and so much uncertainty about how to actually deliver high value care. Mm -hmm. So one of the areas I've been very involved in is new models to try to improve the coordination of very complex patients. Um, if you look at that literature, which is um, a large literature and a, a literature with a, a history of many decades, what you unfortunately find is those programs often don't save money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they sometimes improve outcomes, they sometimes reduce hospitalization, but they rarely make back their money. 
And so I, I think that what is ultimately most promising, this is a researcher, so you'll hate to hear me say that, mm -hmm. is we need to do much better research. I mean, if you think about the size of the healthcare sector and the amount of money we put into generalizable research of this type is extraordinarily small. And so I do think there are models out there, clever models where we can figure out how to coordinate care, how to produce better value. But we need to invest much, much more in rigorously designed studies with excellent control groups. Mm -hmm. You know, natural experiments are one example, but real experiments as well. And that's where I think the promise is. Mm -hmm. um, in applying the scientific method to figure out how to improve the science of the delivery of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I think we, we have begun to set the price architecture for that, but we don't yet have the evidence base that tells us how to actually produce value consistently. And that's where I think we need to, to really focus. Got it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna open it up for questions. We have a microphone here if you'd like to ask one. A reminder, the first three questions are reserved for students, but if you have a question, burning question, want to be our first um, uh, volunteer to ask one, you can start lining up. So I'll ask my last question to you, Secretary Sebelius. We did an interview about a year ago where I asked you kind of what your biggest regrets were about the Affordable Care Act, and I was really interested in your answer. You said it was that you never got a Republican vote for the law. Not that you didn't try hard enough, but that there was this legacy of partisanship that kind of stuck with it. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about what it's meant to have the Affordable Care Act passed on a partisan basis and what it means for future legislation as we seem to be in an era of a lot of partisan legislating. Well, I, I do regret that. And um, you know, in spite of the fact that there were five different bills, three in the House, two in the Senate, hundreds of hours of hearings, lots of amendments, lots of discussions, conference committees, amendments added. Um, at the end of the day, this was an entirely democratic effort. And that has been used from the moment the president signed the bill to today as an example of failed legislation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it, it has been a wound that um, has never healed. And I worry that, um, you know, the, that pattern is clearly being repeated by uh, now the Republicans on their efforts to uh, pass a different version. Uh, but it, it doesn't bode well. I think healthcare is very personal, very, um, uh, it should ideally be uh, somewhat bipartisan. Medicare uh, was fought about um, greatly before it was passed in 1965 and now is wildly popular by, you know, in highly regarded by Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. Medicaid has wide bipartisan support at this point. Um, so once benefits are kind of in place mm -hmm. and ingrained, um, I think they're supported. But uh, somehow this has gotten into this great partisan divide. And I, I wish I had a better answer to how we get at it. It happens differently at the state level. Mm -hmm. So we've had lots of Republican governors who said, I want to expand Medicaid. I believe in health. We're going to reform our state. We're going to lead the way in figuring out innovation. So states operate right now very differently than Congress. And you see much more bipartisan activity saying, you know, the goal is really healthier people mm -hmm. live longer. I mean, Americans still die younger and live sicker than most of our competitive nations. That's not a great place to be as a profile of a country um, trying to compete in a global marketplace. So um, I think governors have figured out a way, Republicans and Democrats, to work in a bipartisan fashion to put bills forward, to steal good ideas from one another. Congress is just stuck. Mm -hmm. Well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> um, we'll take our first question. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Mara Sharp. I'm a graduate student here at the University of Chicago. Um, it seems from reporting that doctors often don't practice the most up-to-date medicine. They may um, do stuff that they learned back in medical school at a residency 20, 30 years ago. What do you think the government can do to possibly incentivize doctors to perform the most up-to-date science that um, studies have shown is actually effective? Dr. Meltzer, do you want to? Take a first pass at that? Well, um, a lot of things. I mean, some of, some of that is incentives, so not necessarily paying for things that are outdated and not, and not worthwhile. A lot of it is information. 
Um, better health IT um, is certainly um, a, a part of it. Um, and, and with that, providing data on the relationship between variations and practices and outcomes, often things aren't clear. So I think those are all parts of the story. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, you know the, the data piece is, is hugely important. In 2009, when Barack Obama became president, um, we did not have any kind of system of electronic health records. We didn't have, um, I think, only about 20% of hospitals and about 10% of providers used on a regular basis some kind of electronic recording. Now, we're still uh, some distance away from full interoperability. And, um, but to finally have patients be able to see their own health records, to be able to have payers measure systems across uh, state lines and, uh, and around the country, and then to be able to look at quality outcomes by individual provider, that, that could have never happened even 10 years ago. You don't get to using proper protocol unless you say, OK, you, cardiac surgeon number one, and you, cardiac surgeon number two, are both in the Stanford system, which is a wonderful system, or the University of Chicago system. You have very different outcomes, very different infection levels, very different. And we are going to start taking not only account of that, but paying you very differently. Um, we're starting to share that with your customers, your patients. and. We're going to share infection rates on hospitals, and we're going to share what's happening. Those are, I think, the way you get to a lot better protocol is transparency, information, sharing that information with patients and customers and payers, and having really that feedback loop be about incentives to either follow protocol or be financially penalized for not following it. And just one small follow-up to amplify that, the problem you're highlighting is really important, that you need providers to be using what we know is best today, not what they thought was best many years ago. But even for things that are universally acknowledged to be best practices, we see lots of failure of adherence to protocols that are like the best practices for the last 20 years and nothing has changed. And the payment system, along with the information system, has to require best practices, yeah. whether it's adoption of innovation or just adherence to best practices that are widely acknowledged, and we're nowhere near there yet. So let me just give you one example, because I think it's a really important question. Um, again, in the Affordable Care Act, there were a lot of payment models based on looking at how you try to drive protocol. One of the low-hanging fruit was infection rates in hospitals. Um, and which often make patients very sick, uh, can kill people, can cause lots of injuries. And Medicare basically set up a structure saying we're going to have a baseline measurement. And hospitals across the country will be penalized if you actually have an infection rate that goes up in your hospital system, not down. If you, there was a 17% nationwide drop in infection rates in hospitals in the first two years. I mean, just boom, payment caused. It wasn't that people were trying to make people sick in the hospital. Or, but if you have 55 things to think about, cleaning constantly, making sure people were washing their hands, having a culture of infection conscious employees throughout the hospital may not have happened. If suddenly your payment is determined by that, it, it caught everybody's attention, and the rates changed. So those kinds of things really do matter. Thank you. Hi, my name's Dylan. I'm a second year student from New Mexico, actually. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the outlook for CHIP and what it'll mean on a state-by-state -state <laughs> basis if Congress fails to reauthorize the program. And just as some context, CHIP is now entering its 50th day? 51. 51st 51 day without day. authorization. <laughs> So if somebody runs a CHIP program, or I don't know who sure. wants to take that. Sure, so uh, CHIP, Children's Health Insurance Program, expired on September 30th. Uh, it's no longer authorized at the federal level. Uh, states have varying degrees of um, money available to maintain their CHIP programs and are running out at, different, at a, on a different pace. So uh, New Mexico, for example, uh, we 
project to run out of money some April, June in, in next year. Other states that were already hitting that, uh, hitting those deadlines and having to figure Colorado. out. Colorado, mm -hmm. I think, is one. Arizona, I know, is an earlier one. I happen to be in the Southwest, I guess. Um, so it's, it's uh, we were talking about it a little bit before, it's utterly surprising to me that mm -hmm. the CHIP program, which has been wildly popular on a bipartisan basis, hasn't, they haven't been able to authorize it, reauthorize it. Uh, everyone, I, I think, is still optimistic that it gets done. Um, and um, if it doesn't, though, for a state like ours, it's um, a $30 million change in federal funding um, that our state will have to come up with to maintain coverage for, uh, for kids in the CHIP program. And if we have non-students who want to ask questions, feel free to join the queue. Yeah. I'm Andrew. I'm a third year public policy major in the college from New York. And something that's been happening in New York City, at least over the last whole bunch of years, is smaller hospitals have become unprofitable and then are either trying to fold or merge together into networks or being absorbed by the bigger hospital networks. So I was wondering if you could talk anyone who wanted to about keep making sure that hospitals remain profitable enough to stay open in the way that the future looks, at least in making giant networks, whether that's the biggest move. Well, Dr. Meltzer may sure. have a slightly yeah. different view. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Um, so it's, it's complicated. And um, nah. who knew healthcare was complicated? <laughs> One could argue we may have too many hospital beds. Uh, across the board, and some hospitals probably should close. Uh, so let's start there. Hospitals also, um, many systems, and I'll give Topeka, Kansas as an example, as a town that had two competing hospitals, and somebody, you know, St. Francis Hospital would start having and running an MRI, and Stormont Vale, which is six blocks away, would also have an MRI and begin to run that a new cancer unit and a new cancer unit. Uh, so there was a competition in fixed costs that frankly was just unsustainable. What has happened in Topeka is one of those hospitals is, is gonna close and there will be a larger, uh, better functioning hospital and that's probably not a bad deal. It's, it's troublesome to um, people who have a great loyalty to the one that's closing. What's more disturbing I think in hospital closure is rural access. Uh, if you close a hospital often in an area where there isn't easy access to another hospital, you can close a town uh, because people don't want to live in an area where they can't get some access to a hospital. But um, I think it's, it's going to be somewhat of a wave of the future. If, if preventive care is more effective, if we can stop the revolving door of Medicare patients returning to the hospital over and over again, and particularly chronically ill people, if they can get better care results by being in a home-based care setting, uh, we won't need as many beds in a hospital. And again, that may not be ultimately a sign of success or failure. It may be a reasonable way to consolidate um, uh, infrastructure. Everybody shouldn't have an MRI. Everybody doesn't need an advanced cancer center. Everybody doesn't need to replicate services, but patients, I think, need access to specialty care, need certainly access to primary care in a very um, close proximity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have too many hospitals. Yeah. So, I, I, so I, I actually agree with all that. <laughs> um, but the, the only, University of Chicago certainly should the, keep the, hospitals. <laughs> the, the only thing I, I, I would, well, first of all, there are many hospitals that should close. They're just too small to make sense. I think there's a separate related issue, though, that you may be combining, which is one of merger and consolidation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've seen a lot of hospitals join into networks. And they join into networks because some of the new movements in payment policy yeah. encourage them to take risk and require analytical expertise that they may not have. And, um, and so they, they move into that. And that decreases competition. And when you decrease competition, in general, you raise price and you lower quality. And, and so I think that's the thing we should really be worrying about. Um, trying to, you know, and, and why have we done it? We've done it because we want to support these new payment models, often because we're interested in care integration. But I think we are paying a hidden cost for this care integration. And I think one of the challenges is to figure out 
are there ways to integrate care without necessarily buying into consolidation in the market? I mean, the, the last thing I'll just say is that if you look at the history of academic medicine in the United States over the past half century, it is a history of the success of dominant players in their markets, the Vanderbilts, the University of Pittsburgh, and relative shrinkage of those academic medical centers that are in very competitive markets, Chicago, New York, LA. And that's a reflection of the fact that there's money to be made by pushing out competition in markets. And if you're an academic institution, you use that to pay faculty, which some of us may like, but probably isn't uh, the preferred social outcome. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there is an inherent conflict that you're highlighting in health policy, thinking about consolidation, uh, coordination of care versus competition. That a lot of the policies we're talking about rely on competition between providers to give the highest quality service for the lowest price, between insurers to drive down premiums. If you don't have enough competitors, there's no way to drive down prices. And there's clear evidence that when providers consolidate, provider prices go up. When insurers consolidate, premiums go up. You need competition to get those competitive prices. That said, small volume hospitals do not serve people well. There's this yeah. downward sloping relationship that the, the smaller your volume, the higher the error rate, the fewer patients you're seeing with the same conditions, the less good you are at taking care of those patients. And one of the primary drivers of the number of nights in the hospital is the number of beds that there are. If you look at variation across the country, beds drive utilization because the way we pay for healthcare, that, that's allowed to persist. So there's a sweet spot where you need enough providers to have competitive pricing, but you need big enough providers to provide high quality care. And when you see consolidation, there's no evidence that you get improved quality. There's a claim, oh, we'll consolidate vertically and we'll get better coordinated care, better handoffs, we'll consolidate horizontally and we'll have transfer of records across different places. There's very little evidence that you see improvement in quality and ample evidence you see increases in prices. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi there, Doc Shahan, first year uh, college student and a news reporter for the Chicago Maroon. <laughs> Uh, my question is regarding the public option for healthcare, or more like a public insurance option, which people can directly pay the government and get insurance. Uh, this option was uh, mentioned in um, a book by Wendell Potter, who was uh, who spoke in the Senate for how the government should have their own like insurance option, how they so that they could make the private insurers more competitive. Uh, what do you think of like? a public insurance in, uh, option, or um, and how likely is it that it can, uh, how will it affect uh, the American population? And in general, like, is it possible to implement it now? And can I tack on for that? Yeah. Also, one of the things being debated very heavily in the Democratic Party is a single payer system. If I could tack on a reaction to that as well as public option. Well, there was a public option in the Affordable Care Act bill mm -hmm. until Joe Lieberman decided that he would not support the public option. And um, I still remember, I sort of have PTSD <laughs> watching him on Meet the Press because he failed to tell anyone in the administration that he now was going to be a no vote on a public option. And um, within five minutes of his statement, I got a call from the President of the United States saying, what? <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's a secret. Um, so I, I'm a big believer that uh, having that kind of a choice would have made a difference. Failing the public option, it's why Congress then went to the second um, kind of difficultly created construct, which was the co-op. And it was really to set up an insurance company in the markets where there wasn't any competition or when there was a monopoly market. Um, Congress, uh, the adversaries of the Affordable Care Act quickly figured out that for these very fragile new insurance companies, that if they took away their funding, if they did not do the risk pooling payments that they had promised, they would collapse. And indeed, that's what happened. Uh, the Republicans in Congress blocked the funding. And one by one, the insurance co-ops, who actually had pretty good enrollment numbers, but they couldn't sustain it.
So fast forward, I think having, um, there are all kinds of programs floating around about, you know, do you let 55-year-olds, for instance, one of the great ways to balance a risk pool, let 55-year-olds buy into Medicare if they would choose or enter into a private company. That, that takes the population more likely to have a pre-existing condition and perhaps moves them into the Medicare program. There now is uh, a discussion of Medicare for all, but just to make it clear, we don't have a single payer system in this country. It doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah. Medicare right now has 53, 54 million people. A third of those beneficiaries choose to have their Medicare benefits delivered through a private insurance company, the so-called Medicare Advantage Plan. So we, we have even in the Medicare construct, private and public choices. And I don't think that's a bad idea with very strong government oversight and regulation. But I, I think having competition, as um, the former speakers have said, is the very best way to get better care, better quality, and lower costs. And we still don't have enough competition. And, and there's no question, Medicare runs on a 3 to 4% overhead costs. Medicaid runs even more cheaply than that. Uh, they are by far the most efficient forms of health insurance that we have, much more efficient than the commercial markets, and um, they would be good competitors. Do you think single payer could work in the United States? I think the problem with single payer, I mean, it might. Um, the problem with single payer is you'd have to take the 180 million people who are in employer plan and cancel their insurance and start all over again. So if you think the Affordable Care Act battles, <laughs> which affected mostly uninsured and about 8 million people who are already buying their own coverage, if you think that fight was complicated, try telling half of the American people that they're going to lose their coverage and, oh, by the way, the government will take it over. Um, so I politically, I don't know how we get there. I think you can actually move in from the margins. and. I think putting 55-year-olds, or giving 55-year-olds on a, an option saying buy into Medicare, or giving anybody in a market that only has one insurance an option of buying into Medicare. I mean, Medicare right now is 53 million folks. You can't put enough sicker, older people to change that risk pool. It's already a big risk pool. It already operates all over the country. It has 98% of providers, virtually every hospital, every drug company, every device company. It already has a network. So you don't have to build anything. You could give people that option in a heartbeat and, and then have a very functioning public option right away. Thank you. My name is Sarah Nakasoni. I'm a third year in the college, and I work with the Chicago Area HIV Integrated Services Council, which oversees the $93 million we spend fighting the state's epidemic and the city's epidemic specifically. My question is this, especially since the HIV epidemic has broken so greatly along racial lines. How do we increase the diversity of voices in the health policy field, particularly as it relates to people of color and people of the LGBTQ community? You know, I, I think the academics need to, I mean, it's a great question. Um, there certainly are some federal programs attempting to do that. Uh, the Commission Health Corps, um, the programs that actually pay providers, uh, medical school debts, and others if they serve in underserved communities, uh, looking for matches uh, in the Indian Health Service, I mean, going into inner city areas. But um, I think it's got to start at a much earlier age. Uh, you know, how do we get more um, talented minority students interested in science when they're in the seventh and eighth grade? Uh, you know, you can't wait till you get to medical school. You got to start. How do we, and I, I'm not sure I'm well equipped to answer those well, questions. I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, we, we've not solved the problem, um, but I think we're making a lot of progress. Um, and it's the product of, of years of investment and it will be you know, years in paying out. So um, I mean, starting at the earliest stages, for example, just here on campus, we run a program called Training Early Achievers for Careers in Health Research or Teach Research, where we take honors minority kids from the Chicago public schools and we engage them in research that then gives them experience and confidence in, in, in working on these problems. 
When you look at how we do research, research has become incredibly community engaged. I spent the middle part of my day with our community advisory board um, working on a program we call the Comprehensive Care Community and Culture Program, which takes this reformulation of, of care for high-risk patients and on top of it adds systematic screening for unmet social needs, community health workers, people who come from the, you know, from the community are engaged in health, and then a community arts and culture program that engages community organizations. That is not atypical. Those of us who do community-oriented interventional research have truly changed how we've done research over the past decade. And so um, it will take you know, many more decades until those people grow and become you know, the people who take care of all of us. But um, we're starting to make progress. Now, that doesn't mean that we've made all the progress we can. But I think the world has already begun to change. And I think the demands, I would just add, um, you know, 25 years ago, there weren't enough women uh, in medical school. There weren't enough women looking at being providers of any level. The, the idea of a nurse practitioner didn't exist. They didn't. So that has changed. Uh, we got to accelerate the pace of change because we can't wait for another two generations to have a much more um, reflective health provider network of the communities that they're serving. So we got to figure out ways um, to do that. But I think the kinds of programs that are underway, NIH is now running programs specifically aimed at more minority researchers. Um, a terrifying study done at NIH recently, kind of double blind look at who was getting the um, grant applications uh, successfully reviewed and found that it was overwhelmingly white applicants as opposed to minority applicants. So they doubled down on trying to get mentorships very early, trying to help grant right, trying to figure out ways to change that at a much earlier stage. So I think that that kind of effort, that kind of awareness, measuring what's happening, looking at what's been successful, trying to scale it up really has to happen. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jesse. Uh, I'm a student at U Chicago. My question was actually going to go back to single payer. I want to hear from the other panelists on if you think the United States can ultimately become a single payer system or have a single payer system, or um, if it is feasible. Because I know that in some states like California, there is a movement in trying to push uh, for a single payer. So if it's not feasible to get the entire United States to become a single payer system, wouldn't it be more feasible if each state pushed for single payer and then? You know, that could make a domino effect so that the entire United States can have that, um, that system. So maybe I'll inject a note of caution in holding up Medicare as a great example that we would want everyone to be in. Put looking at the 70% who are in fee-for-service versus the 30% who are in Medicare Advantage, <laughs> Medicare fee-for-service, I don't think many people would hold up as a model of efficient delivery. We get way too much of some stuff, way too little of other stuff, really disparate quality of care across the country. The prices are always wrong. I spent six years on the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission where we tried really hard to give good advice on prices, and at the end conclusion was always, well, these prices aren't right now, and they're going to be really wrong tomorrow. It took Medicare some you know, almost 50 years to introduce a drug benefit because drugs weren't important when Medicare was formed in 1965 in terms of the types of care that was available to people that ought to be insured against. So Medicare is slow to evolve, not particularly efficient in the way that it delivers health care and doesn't incentivize the high value innovation and discourage the low value use. That doesn't mean that I think we shouldn't have Medicare, and I think Medicare does lots of things right, but I don't think we should feel too comfortable saying everybody should be in the Medicare fee-for-service program. And that injects a note of caution about how optimistic we ought to be about a single payer system to drive more innovative care and more innovative coverage. I mean, I, I would just add, I guess, from building on a comment the secretary said earlier, you know, states as these laboratories of democracy, right, innovation centers, potentially, uh, could you take, could California form a, and, and create a single-payer system? I know Vermont tried early uh, and, and backed off, and 
it'd be an, inter an interesting experiment. I think it'd be interesting to see what happens. I think there's some real challenges to, to getting there, potentially when you bring Medicare, try to bring Medicare into a state and let a state um, try to manage that as a single payer system. It'd have, it would have to be a part of the equation and it's not the way it's financed today. So uh, just Secretary Sebelius mentioned um, the, the concern many people would have if their insurance were to change. I think that's a concern. I actually think the even bigger problem is all the providers whose livelihood is built on the current system. I, you know, as a physician, you sort of go in hoping you're improving people's health, and that's the motivation. But you pretty quickly learn that the profession that you're part of is not solely committed to that. Um, and it's not just doctors. It's every profession. It's every provider group. It's every industry. And the bottom line is, you know, you have you know, harms to the many, which are sometimes modest, but benefits to concentrated power that are extremely difficult to overturn. And that's the biggest reason I think we're not going to see change anytime soon. And I think I've reported a lot on the single payer movement. I would actually circle back to something you said at the beginning, our prices. You could create a single payer system in America with our prices, it would be incredibly expensive. <laughs> so you really would have to create single payer and price set at such a rate, it'd be pretty disruptive. It's not saying it can't be done. I think Taiwan built their single payer system within the past two decades. It's been done. It's just um, a lot of disruption, like you mentioned. Um, and I think we have our final Thank question. Thank you. My name is uh, Mike Petrovic. I'm a fourth year medical student here at Pritzker. Uh, my question is actually a very similar topic that in other developed countries, they use uh, all payer rate settings. And I think some states here, I think Maryland continues to do that. Um, so without creating a single payer system, I know that's uh, still politically challenging given the lobby, uh, lobby efforts that would be against it. Um, but do you think something like that would be appropriate to keep people on their private plans? Uh, and if you do think it's appropriate, how, how you might get past some of those lobbying efforts? You know, I think it's a great question, and I, I, I'm a great admirer of the, of the sort of payment um, systems. Maryland has had um, some considerable success, I think, in, in looking at rates. I, um, I find it really interesting that uh, the debate around the Affordable Care Act and the debate that's still underway today, you would assume that government really took over <laughs> insurance, right? And government took over everybody's coverage and government is running things. We are not there at all. And in some ways, that's where you might want to be for price controls. Um, just the issue of drugs. Um, I find it really interesting that the American public overwhelmingly says we want somebody to control drug prices. We want somebody to do something about drug prices. And yet, there have been six bills introduced in recent memory in Congress, and not a single sentence has anything to do with drug prices, right? Um, so uh, I, I think that all payer uh, formats can work. I think more states need to adopt that approach. I mean, Congress never does anything that states haven't already done. Let's start there. I mean, they never are first on things. They are always usually watching what's happening. Probably the Affordable Care Act without the Massachusetts model would not be the law of the land today. I mean, it, it needs to happen. So more states, that's a California thing. That could be a Maryland thing. I mean, when you get to some sort of price model, we could probably then urge Congress to pick that up, but they're not going to be first. I don't. And this administration, I think is very loath to do anything but unravel government oversight on prices, not push it. So states are going to have to step into the lead. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us here tonight. Uh, it's been an incredible conversation. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right. Yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Have a nice evening.